Lars, we're back. David Finley joining us. And Dave, welcome back to the show. It's been quite some time since you've come on. Uh, we're super glad that you are here and talking about the New Japan Pro Wrestling San Jose show coming up. Lars, when is that? Since you'll be there. I believe it's the 19th. Is that correct, Dave? It is Saturday. The, I should, probably should have known this right off. The oh, no. Head. So it's the same with us. Uh, I believe it is Saturday the 18th. The 18th. It's the 18th, but it's sold out. Yeah. So it's, uh, it doesn't you can't even go, matter. You but can't you can go. watch it any place you get your pay-per-view. So order now. It's going to be the hottest pay-per-view well, ticket. I think you can get it on pay-per-view uh, through Fight TV if if memory serves me correct. So I believe I'm a, that's correct. Yes, and I'm pretty excited about it. But anyways, Dennis. Dave, uh, last time we talked to you, you were, I believe at that time, you were tag team champion in Impact and maybe New Japan at the same time? Uh, no, I think I was just the uh, Impact tag team champion at the time. Um, uh, well, yeah, it's been a minute. Yeah. Thanks for having me back. Glad to be back. A lot's changed. Now you are venturing out on your own. Uh, you know, you don't have your buddy juice with you right now, which is, is a shame. I liked you both as a tag team. Is there an adjustment for you now? Cause you kind of lose and I've listened to many interviews back then and now, and you kind of refer to him as your big brother. And now you're venturing off into this wrestling landscape without your big brother. Uh, well, I'm actually really enjoying being on my own. Um, it's been cool. I got to do the G1. I think I did a pretty good job in the G1. I uh, main evented a pay-per-view against Will Ospreay unsuccessfully uh, against uh, him for the United States Championship. Um, so it's been kind of successful. Had a couple really, really close ones. Uh, but I'm really chasing that big one this next year. Well, you know, New Japan is obviously making a bigger splash here in America with TV, with partnerships, you know, with Impact. You know, you see some of the wrestlers on, you know, pretty much a lot of the different TV shows. Um, how do you how are you seeing this company grow? Because you kind of were there sort of at the precipice of what's happening right now. Um, well, so I've been there kind of right around when they first got New Japan World. So I've kind of been along the ride for, I mean, since 2015. Right. Oh, just to, to see the presence of New Japan grow. Uh, in the states has been really cool. I, I slowly but surely we're becoming um, more widely recognized. Uh, I I think New Japan is the highest caliber of professional wrestling. Um, I think that's the standard that we carry proudly. Um, so yeah, and I I think you know any fan of wrestling likes good wrestling. So the more eyes we can get on New Japan, I think the more it's going to grow. It's just uh, an organic thing that'll happen. Just the other day, and and kind of sticking on this, I kind of noticed there's. I'd say maybe the generation before you, uh, we always talk about how there's not much loyalty in sports, whether it's pro sports, baseball, basketball, and even wrestling. Uh, you're so one of those guys that seem to be the exception to the rule where y you keep coming back home to New Japan. You're happy there. You've mentioned in many interviews how this is where you want to be. This is where you want to grow. Is Is that something that I, I guess the question is, how does that seed get planted in you where you're not chasing the contract, but you're chasing the skill and you, you seem to be chasing getting better over the big contract? Yeah, so I, I want to be world champion. Um, you are my as everyone, Yeah, <laughs> thank you. As everyone, like, I mean, like I'm a fourth generation wrestler. Wrestling is ingrained in me. It's it's, yeah. it's all we talk about. When I'm with my dad, when I'm with my grandfather, it's like wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. But my family hasn't had a world championship. So for me, uh, to be the pinnacle, to be at the pinnacle of wrestling would be to be the IWGP World Heavyweight Champion. So like I have unfinished business in New Japan. Like that's been my goal since day one. And like I I can't go anywhere else. Don't want to go anywhere else until uh, really ever, but like that's my goal. And until I achieve that, I'm I'm not crossing any other bridges well there's been a lot of development with the character and there's been different sorts of looks and things that have happened over the last you know a couple of years and you kind of do one thing and do one thing over here so 
what's inspiring you right now? Where are you at with that creative creatively as far as like how you're pre presenting yourself? Um, so right now I call myself the rebel and to me, it's representative kind of just how I feel about like growing up in the new Japan system. You know, I've done everything by the book and uh, I, my accolades are uh, far and few between. And uh, so for me, it's like, no, I got to do things my way. I got to do things as a Finlay, not as a new Japan young boy, not as a new Japan wrestler, but I got to do things as a Finlay. I got to do things my way. So uh, that's kind of how I approach, you know, my matches, uh, you know, any, any people that I'm feuding with, it's just like, I got to make this about me. Well, how are you separating the new Japan new boy to the man that you're becoming now? I mean, it's like, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, that's where I really want to get a little bit into this because, you know, you've been, you, you kind of identified yourself as new Japan. Does that make sense? So is yes. it, is it conflicting with, with what you're trying to do now? Uh, I don't, think so um for me the big difference maker is my shillelagh um you know I, I i carry that as one it's kind of like my banner going into battle like i this represents the finlay family but also like it's my insurance policy it's you know it's a weapon um in irish culture this is like you know once you have your shillelagh this is you're a man this is your rite of passage but it's number one intention is as a weapon so uh to me and time will show time will tell but to me the shillelagh is the difference maker. You, well, you, and you know what? I just want to say that I that your father hit me in the head with the shillelagh once in Madison, Wisconsin. So really, I, yes, <laughs> and it fucking hurt, bro. Yeah, it my uh, my little brother used to chase me around the house with my dad had like five or seven or eight of them laying around <laughs> all over. The so like my little brother is ten years younger than me would like chase me around the house with these things, just winging them at me. So I know how they feel. Well, your dad was always very gracious with me and, you know, so, but I, he, he hit me right there. Oh my God. It hurt for days. I digress. <laughs> you, you know, this, at least for me following you, this might seem like the first time you've really leaned into your Irish heritage in a, mm -hmm. in a wrestling gimmick. Uh, I know there's a lot of guys that go out there and work really hard to separate themselves from their parents' legacy. You seem like a guy that it, it just kind of came natural where there wasn't much. Is David Finley going to be like his dad? Is David Finley going to be an Irish character? Is David? You know, so it seemed like that wasn't something that might be hard for you to do. And I may be projecting that onto you. So what was the motivation to bring in this Irish gimmick into the rebel person? So <laughs> I'll backtrack a bit on that. Uh, so when I first, started wrestling i was like 19 years old the last thing i wanted to be was my dad so i was like adamant on like i'm not gonna have any similarities whatsoever but i'm so much like my dad naturally that it just like <laughs> as time has passed i've kind of like morphed into a version of him in in real life like i mean we have similar sense of humor similar mannerisms uh i, I think we wrestle similarly um so just kind of embracing like who I am. I am a Finlay. Um, and and I, to me, that name carries weight. That that comes with like an expectation. Uh, so for me, it was as opposed to like shying away from what I am, embracing it and trying to uh, really reach my full potential of like what I can be in wrestling. Well, I think that's a, that's an interesting thing that you bring up. And I feel like it's it's like natural in our lifetimes, right? So you know, you, you almost, you try to separate so much from family and these things, even though you love them and whatever, but you're trying to find your own individuality. But at some point you kind of come back and you kind of go, well, fuck. Yeah. I am a pagan Viking or whatever. You're Irish, you know, with a yeah. shillelagh, you know? So it's like, at some point you accept that. So was there a struggle internally? Because you've always spoken highly about your father. We, and you know, you obviously have a lot of respect for, for, for the, I mean, like you said, four generations of wrestling. Um, but do you feel like there was a struggle for you to kind of come back to that kind of, uh, the, the, uh, how would you say it, that heritage? Uh, yeah, I did. Especially when I first decided that I was going to, you know, incorporate the shillelagh as, you know, part of me. Uh, I was real unsure about it because, like, on one, like, it's been done. My dad did it. But also, like, 
it is like a heritage thing. It's an Irish thing. It's not just a my right. it's it means something. Um and uh also I I I think there's a lot of routes that I can go with it. Um, you know, in, in wrestling. Uh and I really feel like we've only you know, scratch the surface on that. But like, I, yeah, it, it was a real big struggle because like, like you said, it's like finding that, like of that balance of like who I really am and my own indiv- individuality and also like who I am as like my family and my family name. Cause like, you know, if you're a heart, there's an expectation on you. If you're a Mysterio, there's an expectation on you, you know, um, it, it, it comes with the territory. So it, it's really just finding like, who I am within, like, who I really am and can't escape. Right. You, you know, to kind of follow up on this whole shillelagh thing, uh, when you get it, is it A, th- this may be a multi-level question, so bear with me here. It Was it your dad's? Did you have one made? Was there like a, hey, dad, can I get this? And there's a tear that runs down his eyes. Like, I thought you'd never ask. And he opens <laughs> up this box and there's a light. And he's like, <laughs> this is my favorite. Take good care of it. Or did you like throw it at you and you're like, Cool. Bring it back Wednesday. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I texted my dad. I was like, hey, I want to start using the shillelagh. Do you have any left? Because I'm pretty sure he sold them in Japan. Um, He sold a lot of them in Japan. So, he actually had one left. He was like, yeah, I got it. I'm like, cool. So, I drive over to his house, go get it. And this thing's like, the knob on it's like this big. It's so big. I'm like, I don't like how this feels in my hand. It feels clunky. So, uh, I ended up having my own made. Um, it feels way better. Also, my dad's was like from like 15 years ago. I think he got it in like 2006. So like the wood's flaking off. It's all like discolored. It's like half rotting. Like it's just not, it was not sturdy anymore. So yeah, I, I got my own chalet because I wanted it to be my own. Well, you know, thinking about the great Irish wrestlers that we've had, you know, from the European days, Germany, England, obviously, you know, and, and their style, it's such a, and it, I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, your learning curve is more of that UK European kind of style of wrestling. Do you think that fits better with the Japanese pro wrestling than the American, or would you say the opposite? I, honestly, I think it can go either way. Um, at least for how wrestling is like today, I feel like, uh, you know, like American style versus like the, you know, the UK European style versus like the Japanese style. Obviously they have their differences, but like, I feel like a lot of them have borrowed from each other to where like, it kind of goes wherever you want it to go. You know, it it can work in America on TV. It can work in Japan where, you know, it's, it's way more competitive. Uh, I, I, it kind of works wherever you want it to go in my opinion. You know, I kind of want to jump back into this whole tag team wrestler thing. And once again, last time you were on, you talked a little bit about it and you've talked a little bit about it in between. Now you are venturing out. And I think even in that interview, Lars, if I'm correct, he was like, I don't want a team with uh, Juice forever because I want to be a world champion. Now you have that opportunity. I feel like you're welcome. I helped you with that. Uh, Thank you very much. You're you're welcome. (laughs) But but what... I'm trying to think of the best way to ask this about like being typecast because I feel like you were kind of close to being typecast as a tag team guy. And in wrestling, when you start to get typecast as the funny guy, the tag team guy, you it's so hard to break out of that if you can. Somehow you you and Juice both avoided being tag team guys. You venture out on your own. When you look back, do you realize how close you were to being typecast as that guy? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's part of where like the split came. Um, I think Juice and I just kind of realized that like neither was real, like our goals and aspirations did not involve tag team wrestling. Like we'd done, you know, we'd been world champions in new Japan. We'd been world champions in impact. We'd won world tag league over new Japan. We won the belts at the Tokyo. Don't like what we did. We've done it. Do we want to do it again or do we want to move forward? And I, I, for both of us, it was like, nah, we have like, our own goals that we want to achieve. So it just kind of like naturally happened to where we both also like we, work-wise, we didn't know like where we were going to end up working. Uh, and I, it was, we didn't want to be tied to each other either. So it was just like, uh, let's see, you know, where we both end up. 
and take it from there. So just we just kind of like mutually decided that we wanted to pursue our own thing. You mentioned that the, the G1, and I kind of wanted to get into that a little bit because I always feel like those G1s are the cream of the crop, or at least like the, the new up and comers, the sh the, where the light needs to shine, or, you know, just the, the badasses, right? And I think it, that tournament's always been that way. You know, I mean, some are better than others, but so you get invited. Uh, what are you thinking about yourself at that point? I'm just curious, like, what's going on in your head? Because that's basically saying, I mean, you're kind of you're kind of one of the ones here. Yeah. So I, I I've wanted to do the G1 for I mean since I got to New Japan. I started off as a junior heavyweight, but like still I was like I want to my goals were I want to be a heavyweight. I want to do a G1. Um, and it took me seven years to finally get in the G1. Part of that was you know pandemic and you know travel issues and visa issues and like injury. So like it, it was snake bit for a while. So for me to finally get to the point where like, all right, I'm in this thing. It's go time. Um, because I feel like in New Japan, you don't really have the respect of the fans because you haven't been able to prove yourself as a pro wrestler until you've been in the G1. Right. Cause I really think that's where you know you get thrown into the deep end and sink or swim. Um, so to finally be able to like put the work in to be like, no, I'm I'm as good as I believe I am, I can do this. I'm one of the best wrestlers in the world to finally be able to like put that into action and show that I can do it felt really good to me. Do you, when they come to you, do they ask you if you want to be in it or do you kind of go, Hey, listen, this year, I noticed you're two or three guys short. Do, can I get into this? How does, how does being invited in that? Cause I believe PD was in a G one. I believe it's either a G one or, or something super, like that. He was, I think in. it was a super junior. Okay. Yeah. So for me, I basically, it was, uh, I, we were talking about like uh, just the future moving forward with what we we're going um, to do just with work. And uh, I, I, they brought it up at the same time that I brought it up. Like they were like, we're going to put you in the G1. And I was going like, Hey, I really need to be in the G1. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just a mutual agreement of like, all right, yeah, this is where we both want to go with this. So uh, yeah, I was, I was really happy. I'd been training for it for a long time. Um, I was a little sad that it was a smaller, uh, a smaller like block system. There was four blocks this year, so it was only six singles matches. Usually, it's two blocks. You get like nine or ten singles matches. So, like, I really wanted to get thrown into the deep waters, but uh, you know, it was a special G one. They switched up the system, so I, I think I, honestly I don't know, but I would assume this next year is going to be back to the regular one. So I'll, I'll really like to put in those nine hard singles matches, and uh, you know, showcase what I can do even more. Well, you know, as, as a wrestler and as a foreign wrestler in Japan, I mean, you know, I've always been sort of curious on how you go about lobbying for yourself in that, because obviously there's a language barrier. There's there's all kinds of barriers there. You know, and if you go to Japan, you know that the cab drivers don't speak English. Nobody really. It's not really like a language that's really known by a lot of the Japanese people and I mean, we're fortunate enough when we go over there, you get a translator. I'm sure that they have their, that there too. But I mean, is there a way, how long did it, did, did it take for you to kind of understand how to communicate what your needs and wants were without looking like, you know, looking stupid, I guess, I guess, I guess for lack of a better term. <laughs> I mean, I, I think to some extent, I probably still look a little bit stupid. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I mean, I would say probably the first three months I got there, it was just a nightmare. I had no idea what was going on. Every, like the signs are all in squiggles. I don't understand a word of what anyone's saying. I remember my first day at the dojo. I know I probably told this story before, but like we do, we start off the day with a thousand squats and they're counting in Japanese. And I have no idea what number we're on. So I'm just watching the clock. So like that was like my start in New Japan or just in Japan in general. And then eventually just like with being immersed in the culture, in the language, like I, figured out how to survive like i knew numbers i knew what my number was at like truck stops so i didn't have to ask anybody anymore like i could ask for like the basic things that you know i would need now i'm at a point where like i i can enjoy my life in japan and i don't have any issues because i know you know i'm a creature of habit so i go to the same spots i order the same things i know what i want so like now it's no issue but it, it took like a good three months before i was like uh okay i can kind of navigate this place right 
Er, earlier in the episode, we were talking about uh, yesterday. I, I want not say yesterday. It was a week ago or so. I got recognized in public. Someone's like, oh, I love the podcast. You're on it. Hey, when you go over to Japan, do you remember the first time someone came up and was like, David Finley, because when that, I'm sure you get it a little bit over here before you went over there, but you know now you're over there, different fan base, different culture. How was that for you? So uh, I actually didn't start getting recognized in the States until I started doing Impact. Um, but in Japan, I do remember the first time that happened to me because it was bizarre. Because I grew up, growing up, I'd seen this happen with my dad a lot. So it, to a point where like, I knew it was unusual, but it was also like normal. Um. But again, like it was that was happening to my dad. So the first time it happened to me, I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> like, oh, I'm starting to make it. And yeah, I was in Japan at uh, the train station by the dojo, like in like the shopping mall. I was in an H and M on the second floor, and someone came out to me and was like, oh, David Finlay. I'm like, hell yeah, I am. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so yeah, I took a picture with them and stuff, and I just felt like the coolest motherfucker that day. <laughs> well you know one of the things i was thinking about and i don't think i ever i asked you last time you were here but um as being like an um, um you know a foreign wrestler in japan do do, do any of the japanese wrestlers uh kind of give you guys a grace period like because of the communication maybe there's a botch in something or a misunderstanding in a match or or, I mean, have you ever had like legitimate like heat with somebody because maybe you didn't quite understand what was going on and or anything like that? Um, not that I can think of. Everyone's like really gracious and understanding of like the language barrier. Most of the times so they'll speak English to us, you know, we'll try and or at least I'll try and like use the Japanese that I do know. So it's like a blend of like really bad Japanese and like English that's like pretty good. <laughs> So uh, obviously they're speaking the English and I'm speaking the bad Japanese. Um, so like I, it, communication wise, like it, it, we figured it out. It's a weird hybrid way of communicating, but like it, it seems to be pretty smooth. You, I kind of want to go back because I was thinking about one of Lars's questions about the the evolution of you, and you you go from clean cut to scruffy to a rebel. And you know, I know last time you were on, we talked about your creative process and the evolution of you. Now you are reinventing yourself. You are now top of the card. You, you, you've you worked your way up. Do you tie the two together where this is why, because I'm here? Or is it a happy accident where the two, the new look, Will Ospreay and you, main eventing, come together at the perfect time? Uh, I think for me, it was just, I, I knew I needed to do something different than what I was doing um, to get to where I wanted to be. So a lot of it was just like taking a gamble on like, well, let's see what happens. Um, and I, I just so happened to find success. So I think, I think it was more of a happy accident than anything else. Um, but it just stemmed from like, all right, well, I'm not where I want to be. So like, I, I need to change something about me to get to where I want to be. So it really just came from like, I, I guess almost like desperation, I guess. Mm. Now I got a follow up, Lars. Sorry. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of young guys that listen to this, that want to always get into the wrestling industry and the business, but they don't know how to put those creative building blocks into place. Do you have any advice to give to someone as a guy who has just kind of done it and has been successful with doing it that you can say, Hey, you know, if you're looking for inspiration, this is how I did it. I mean, for me, I just kind of took things that like I like in my real life. Like, uh, like I grew up, I was like a skate punk kid. So like, I like punk rock music. So like a lot of it is just like, oh, I've seen like different, you know, bands dressed like this, or I've seen this on different, you know? So like the look kind of stems from like a, a rock vibe for me. And it's just like taking inspiration from things that like are me. And like finding a way to incorporate it so that way, like what I'm putting out into the world is still genuine. Like it is genuinely like a, a part of me. Well, and also I think that what, what's going on right now is unique because there's not like that kind of edgy sort of punk rock kind of thing that's happening in that company. You know, I mean, there's a guy in Daisy Dukes. You got, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who yeah. am I love? I love him. I yeah. love him. I love him. I love him. But, you know, you got, you got, 
and everybody and or you got Will Ospreay. It looks like a goddamn ostrich. You know, what I mean, so it's like, well, who am I love too? You know, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. That, you know, I love that. I mean, he's so flamboyant. He's and you know, there's so many different personalities. And that's one of the things why I love that company so much is because, you know, there there's everybody's kind of got an individual thing, you know, um, was so I mean, coming to that place for you just with your history and everything like that you know, and now that you've kind of found this groove, it's like, where does it go from here? Like, do you take it that much more extreme? I mean, you know, are we going to see you with great Muda paint on at some point? Just like fucking uh, upside down <laughs> crosses, like King Diamonds and some shit? <laughs> uh, well, I have no, I have no plans of uh, great Muda paint. I don't think I could pull it off quite <laughs> as uh, awesome as he could. Um, <laughs> but I mean, time will tell. We'll see. You know, uh, it's, it, for me, a lot of it's just trial and error and experimenting like on the go. And uh, I like my creative process is very much like I spitball things and I take it from there. And uh, so like some things work, some things don't. And, it, and it's I it really have to like put it out and see like the feedback I get to know like what works and what doesn't. Because like I can be like, oh, I have all these ideas. But like it's it does if it doesn't resonate with people, then it's not going to work. So I have to like it kind of just is like what resonates and what doesn't. Well, you know, that's one of the things I wanted to also say to you is that it is working. What you're doing right now is working. It is speaking to me. It's like I saw you and I was like, oh, yeah, that's his old shit. That's his culture. Like, that's boom, boom, boom. It's like a great amalgamation. A lot of the times when you get like an Irish character, you know, other than maybe your father, let's say there's not a lot of grit to it. So, yeah. you know, how do you, you know, coming up the way that you come up, do you think that, and I don't think there's a lot of grit, in a lot of the late, uh, the newer kind of professional wrestlers, you know what I mean? Did, was that something that you feel like you, you, you sort of um, suffered to get in the sense, or, or do you feel like that was something you were kind of born with? Was it like, you know, part of the lifestyle and in your family? Like, what do you think that, cause that's, I can tell that with you. So I don't, is that something that you ever been able to put your finger on? Um, so kind of. Uh, so like my, I grew up, my dad was always, like, always the tough guy to this day. His default is tough guy. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, it's like that. you don't always have to tough guy, but always tough guys. It's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so like, and that comes from like, he grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland during, you know, a civil war, basically. So yeah. like he, bombs going off and he was having like fight for his life quite often. So like he grew up in a very rugged time to grow up. Uh, my grandfather, same thing. He was a steel worker as well as a pro wrestler. And he, you know, he was, he would do bar fights. Uh, I had a great, great grandfather that worked on the building crew of the Titanic. And apparently during like their lunch breaks, they would just bare knuckle box for pints of Guinness. So like, it, 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 like having grit and fighting and just not being afraid to get like down and dirty and, and, and gritty is like ingrained in being a Finlay. And that was one of the things where I'm like, I need to embrace this and not shy away from this because this, this is part of what makes, I believe what makes me unique. 100%. You just said something a second ago with Lars's, I think, first question here, where you were talking, where you guys were talking about the evolution of you. And it kind of hit me. In the pro wrestling industry, wrestlers get to a certain point and they're afraid to tinker with their image or who they are. And so it feels like they're stuck trying to protect and grow themselves because they don't have the balls to go, you know what, maybe I am going to change the shirt or I'm going to not do this move or do this, you know, mannerism. What gives you that confidence then to say, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to go out there and try doing this and then this and this when you you are at a spot, you are safe, and maybe there is no need to put it on the line to see if it works or doesn't work. Um, I think because I enjoy the creative process of just like constantly evolving. Um, I've I've grown to really enjoy like just like the quiet hours of like what do I want to try, what do I want to do, kind of you know like studying wrestling or you know just the things that I want to try, and I I just enjoy the whole process of like growing and evolve because like I I when I am done wrestling, I want to be considered one of the greats. Um, and I'm not there yet, which means like, I need to keep growing, uh, in order to achieve that. Um, that's what I want my legacy to be. I want to go down as one of the greats. So to me, it's like, I'm going to keep grinding and finding this path 
And, and, you know, I might stumble. I might, you know, I I'm, I'm, might strike gold. Who knows? But like, I'm going to keep trying until like that is what I become. And that's what motivates me to keep, you know, because I would rather try and fail than just be like scared to try things. Um, and I think that is, I'd, I'd rather just go for it. Well, you know, I want to wrap my last question up with just about the San Jose show. I mean, you're coming in basically to California. You got a sold out house already. I mean, you know, and we're still a couple of weeks away from when it's actually going to come down or, or actually at this point, maybe a couple of days. But, um, you know, how, how, you know, your opponent uh, and these people that you're wrestling with here, it's like, let, let me hear what you got for them. So Bobby Fish holds a singles victory over me. He beat me when I, in my first Super Juniors, 2015. Um, and then he went off to, you know, WWE. He went off to AEW, but he still holds that win over me. And I know, I know for a fact I'm better than him. I know I can beat him. I know I can avenge that loss. So that's why I want to face Bobby Fish in San Jose. That's what I'm coming with. I want my win back. Well, I'm going to wrap this up with my question and also along the lines of San Jose, where before we hit record, I sat here and listened to you and Lars talk about the wrestling scene in San Jose. And I've not seen wrestling. I've seen wrestling in many different states, but I've not seen it on the East Coast. I'm not seen it on the West Coast. So what. I guess this is for both of you guys. What makes that San Jose wrestling scene so different where they just sold out a new Japan show and, you know, I, there's not many shows right now that go anywhere and get sold out. Well, for me, I, so the, the venue that we're running San Jose civic center, I think every time we go there, the people are electric, the wrestling's electric. It's just a great venue. It's a night of partying and wrestling and it's just, it's awesome. Um, the people are coming to have a good time. We're kind of, we're coming to give them a good time. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those venues where like, you know, no matter what, like it's going to be hot, it's going to be good. Everyone's going to go home raving about how great a time they had. And I would say, you know, there's such a deep history and culture of professional wrestling in that area, because you got to remember, San Jose never really had a professional sports team until the San Jose earthquakes. And even then they went away a few times. My point is, is that the one thing that was consistent is you had wrestling in that place. You, you know, I, I, I can't even, I saw Polynesian Pacific championship wrestling in that, in that building. Of course you had the big time wrestling that used to come up and run that building. You had a uh, triple a would run that building. So, I mean, I feel like, and also you know, California, and especially in that area, it's very multicultural. So you get, and, and it's also very smart. And I think there, uh, California in, in, on the Indies and on the, on, in this area, there's a lot of smarter fans. There's a, you know, and you also have a big uh, Japanese population. So I feel like culturally, as far as pro wrestling goes, um, you know, it's, it's actually a really good place. It's, it's actually probably better than a San Francisco. You know what I mean? It's probably mm -hmm. better than a Los Angeles in a lot of ways, just because of the of the the type of people that will come. Because it'll be a melting pot of of different people from different kind of places with different cultures and stuff like that. And I think that's why it works there. Because wrestling, I think, is synonymous with all cultures. I agree completely. Dave, where can people find you, my friend? You can find me on Twitter at the David Finley. You can find me on Instagram at super, super Dave. And that's the only places I really am. You are, you can watch me on new Japan world uh, hey. like all the time. Well, for everybody watching the show is over. We're going to say our goodbyes off the air. David Finley. Maybe you'll become a three time guest here soon. We're glad to have you back. Let's not wait a year and a half to get you back on. Let's do a little Definitely. bit. Sooner, my friend. All right. Please, yes. Thank you for having me. All right, guys, Wrestling Perspective, follow, do all that stuff, watch. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.